he's just about beaten. He's got the seat. He tells the story. No. <laughs> Whoever sits on my seat has to tell the story. Oh, and I'm getting older. And you know what? When you get old and your hair's white and your teeth are... <coughs> yeah. And your brain doesn't work so good and you start to forget all the rest of the story. So this might be the last olden day story. So you'll have to get some mums and dads and granddads and aunties and uncles to tell you some of their stories because they might be far more interesting than my stories. But I remember a long time ago, I must have been about eight or nine years old and my big sister would have been about 11 years old and she was quite bossy. And my little, my young brother was one year younger than me and my little sister, well she must have been only about two or three years old and she was just old enough to know what we were doing when we didn't want her to know what we were doing. So she could go and tell mum and dad what's been going on and so we had to be very careful we decided that we were going to make something special and secret and tell mum and dad about it on Christmas Day. I don't know why we thought this was going to work so well, but we decided that we were going to grow a garden, a secret garden. So when dad ploughed up the ground for the big garden, a great big garden, huge garden, there was a little corner in the paddock on the other side of the little drain, and we said to dad, would you plough this piece for us too, please? And Dad said, you won't be able to grow a garden. Don't worry about that bit. We never plough that. And we said, well, just plough it because it doesn't look right with all the rest ploughed and that piece is not ploughed. Would you plough that piece? So Dad got the horses and he took them over the drain and he ploughed this little piece and uh, he got the old discs behind the horses and they went squeak, squawk, clatter, clatter, squeak, squawk, and round and round they went and chopped up all the ground. And Dad thought, that'll grow a lot of weeds. And he planted his corn and his pumpkins and all the things there. And we didn't put anything in our bit of ground because it's going to be a secret garden, you see. So we waited for a week or two. Then we got up early in the morning and we had a look in the little old shed outside to see what seeds Dad had left in there. And there was all kinds of seeds there. So we took our seeds. There were some radish seeds and some turnip seeds and some corn seeds. And uh, there were some cabbage seeds. And there were some pumpkin seeds. And so we went down every morning for about a week to plant our garden. We did the same as Dad did. We dug some rows and, and we planted in those little hollows and we made some big mounds for the pumpkins just like Dad did and we thought Dad won't even see it in the corner here because he never looks in here and I don't know whether Dad ever noticed it or not but after a few weeks we saw something in our garden that we didn't like it was some little holes little holes here and there what do you think makes little holes in your garden? Rabbits Rabbits. And we thought, that's no good. There's rabbits getting in our garden. What are we going to do? And then we saw some other places that looked like scratchy sort of places. And what makes scratchy things in your garden and nips the top off some of your plants? Pheasants. There's pheasants in our garden. So that's no good. And Big Sister said, we've got to make a scarecrow. And we said, we can't make a scarecrow. We don't want to make a scarecrow. And Big Sister, because she was the boss really, she said, that's what you've got to do. You boys go and get some stuff and make a scarecrow. And we said, how do we make a scarecrow? And she said, you go and get some boards. And she took us to where there were some boards. And you get those boards there and you put them across those ones there and you nail them on and it'll be like a cross. And I said, what do we do with it then? She said, you've got to get some clothes to put on it. And we said, where do we get some clothes? She said, Dad's got some clothes. You can get Dad's clothes. We said, we can't get Dad's clothes. She said, of course you can, because it's summertime now, and Dad only wears a singlet and a pair of shorts, and he doesn't wear his shirt, and so <laughs> you can easily get that. And he's got some long pants, and you don't have to worry about that, because he doesn't wear long pants anyway, only if he goes to a wedding. So <clears throat> we went sneaking, and we got Dad's shirt, 
and we got Dad's long pants and we got a big old belt that he had and we dressed up the scarecrow. We dug a hole and we put it in the ground and then we wanted a hat and we snuck Dad's straw hat one morning early and we put it on the scarecrow and <coughs> Dad got up and he milked the cows and he was ready to take out the cream that morning and he looked for his straw hat because he always put his straw hat on because the sun's hot when you get on the water because we had to row the boat way out on the water to put the cream onto a launch to take it to the cream factory. And Dad couldn't find his straw hat. Where's my straw hat? Who's got my straw hat? And he looked everywhere and he couldn't find it so in the end he had to go without his straw hat and he came home and he was all sunburnt across here and uh, he didn't know where his straw hat was. The next day he was looking for his straw hat and he didn't know where it was. But you know what? The next day, little sister, who was only about that high, who's three years old? Who's three? We've got a three years old. You're three years old. No, you might be a bit more. Well, she was three and she could talk and she said, Dad, I know where your straw hat is. And we said, <laughs> and she said, I know where your straw hat is, Dad. And Dad said, where's my straw hat? She said, I'll take you and show you where your straw hat is. And Dad said, where is it? Come on then. So he took Helen's hand and they walked outside and out the gate and down the little paddock and underneath the marker carpet trees and through the little gate at the end of the fence where the cows go sometimes. But there was a little garden in there and there was Dad's straw hat on top of the scarecrow. And Dad said, aha, now I know what's happened to my shirt as well. And now I know what's happened to my trousers. And so now I know what's been going on. And he looked around and he seemed as though he was very surprised. Well, he took the straw hat off and he unhooked a bit of wire that tied it on and he put it back on his head and he said, oh, good, I'll have this. And then he took the shirt off and said, I'll have my shirt back, thank you. And he said, I'll have my trousers too. So he pulled up the stake and he pulled his trousers off the <laughs> scarecrow and he put the stake back and all we had left was a stake in the ground and no scarecrow. And you know what happened? The rabbits never came back and the pheasants never came back and I think we ate some radish and some turnips out of that garden and a few cobs of corn. I think that's what we got out of that garden, if I can remember right. But what I do remember is little people can tell tales on you, can't they? But you know what? <laughs> that didn't really matter. But remember, there's always someone watching you. And while we were doing our garden, little sister was watching us. So be careful, there's always someone watching you. And so it always pays to do what? The right thing, doesn't it? You know, if we'd asked Dad for an old straw hat, he would have given us one. And if we'd asked him for an old shirt, he would have given us one. And if we asked him for a pair of trousers, he'd have probably said, go and get those ones out of the bottom <coughs> drawer in, in the, in the, the uh, bedroom. I'm sure he would have given one. We just had to ask. I think we need to remember that someone is watching everything we do. God watches everything we do, and when we do the right thing, what? It makes him glad. So let's make sure we do the right thing, because you're being watched. Okay, thank you for being so good. What if this is the last story? Who are you going to ask to tell stories then? Oh, <laughs> The next song that we're going to sing is one that Pastor Ken has chosen. It's hymn number 245, More About Jesus. And you can remain seated as we sing this. Thank you. 
sermon today I've entitled To Ordain or to Abstain. And so you think about that for a second or two as you turn to the text where I want to start this morning and it's in Mark chapter 3 and we read from verse 15 a couple of verses. Mark chapter 3 verses 13 to 15 and then you'll know what the service is about. And he goes up into a high mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. That's Jesus, of course. And Jesus called these people to him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Some of your Bibles might have a slightly different word there than the word ordained. You might have chose or selected or appointed. And when we read this word in the Old King James Bible, upon which uh, mostly we base our views about how we should do things in the church, we read the word ordained and we're sometimes rather confused as to just what was involved in being ordained. So I'm going to talk today about ordination, just what's involved, just what is it all about. Some will have some views which stem from medieval times. Some will have some views which stem from the uh, theories of the church fathers around the three, four, five hundred years after Christ. Some will have some views which would be more in line with modern day Pentecostalism. Some will have some views which are distinctly Seventh day Adventist, and some won't have a clue. So I think today we can try and cover all those bases. So <clears throat> Jesus called these twelve. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. And uh, we will read Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. Matthew 10 verse 1 says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. This is Matthew's account of calling the twelve disciples and what they were to do. And it doesn't specifically say that he anointed them, but he did give them something, and that was the power to against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. Those, of course, are the things that are normally impossible for humans to accomplish, to cast out evil spirits and to heal sicknesses and diseases. Usually we look for very specialised persons whom we assume can do those things. And uh, so this was something very special. Let's go over to Luke and see what Luke has to say. Luke chapter 6. And uh, <coughs> Luke chapter 6, we want verses 12 and 13. Luke 6, I've got 5 there. Luke 6, 12 and 13. And it says... And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Now Luke gives a more uh, extensive account of this and he gives a little bit of background which is important. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. Doesn't say how many. And of them he chose twelve whom also he named apostles. And then it goes down there and tells you the names of those. And uh, so we now have a little bit bigger picture, a little broader. Jesus has called his disciples who went with him to the mountain. Jesus went and prayed because this was a time when he was going to commence the establishment of the Christian church. It was a very significant time, uh, aspect of Jesus' ministry. 
because the people he would select who would establish the foundations of the Christian church had to be the right people. And uh, <coughs> Jesus had many disciples and at times he had hundreds of followers because a disciple is simply one who follows a leader and comes under their teaching or discipline. Discipline not meaning that they get a good spanking if they do something wrong, but their teaching comes under their teaching. And there were many of them there, but Jesus selected 12 out of that big group of people. Doesn't mean to say the others were not ardent followers of Jesus. Doesn't mean that at all, because there were many ardent followers of Jesus who were not amongst the chosen 12. But Jesus chose these 12. So if we put all this together, we discover that Jesus spent time in prayer and getting special, uh, a special indication from his father as to whom he should choose out of this big body of followers and believers. And then he ordained that 12. He selected them uh, and set them apart for the special work of going with him. And still we have to deal with this word ordained. What's that all about? If we look back in Old Testament times, we find that there was various ways of uh, identifying people for very special purposes. And in most instances, it was for the purpose of being a prophet or the purpose of being a ruler or a king. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, you'll find that Moses chose 70 on the advice of his father-in-law. He chose 70. And uh, we don't have a lot of detail of how he went about um, verifying that these men were to be leaders and judges, but uh, there was a ceremony. And according to uh, Alan White, who had insight into these things, that uh, uh, he offered, he and Aaron offered special prayer uh, for these 70 who would become judges of the lesser and more minor matters in Israel with the major matters going to Moses and, uh, and Aaron. So he chose those 70. When we uh, come to the life of David, we find that David chooses judges because he too wanted to start modelling his kingdom after the model that Moses set up while in the wilderness. David, of course, uh, did a few things that he shouldn't have done, such as numbering the people when he wasn't supposed to and so forth. But uh, uh, he did want to set up his kingdom on that basis. And David set up the, uh, the sanctuary services and he set up the, uh, uh, the music system uh, after the order of the Levitical order uh, as uh, Moses and the prophets had done. But he chooses seven and uh, he identified them specifically as... Uh, sorry, he, he chose... Did I say seven? No, I've got that wrong. I'm not sure how many he chose. But he chose these judges. I think it might be 40 judges he chose. But uh, anyway, he, uh, he chose them, identified them for a special work to do in his kingdom. And uh, there was some kind of a service. So we might ask ourselves today, who is ordained in the scripture? Who is ordained? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> in Mark chapter 3, 13 to 15, if we take that statement there that he ordained, Jesus ordained 12, and we take it to mean that he did something to them that made them different, we would be reading more into it than the language allows. Because if you were to read this in the Greek language in which it is written, it doesn't mean that they were given some special privileges, privileges of uh, more power than they would have had before, or more authority than what they had before, nor did they get more spirituality than what they got before. It simply means that they were identified by Jesus, they were identified by him for this work that they were to do. In other words, they were identified as separate from all those other disciples who came uh, with Jesus to the mountain that day. So it really means a kind of selection and uh, selection in itself identifies, doesn't it? If we select something, we've identified it. Church lunch, you make your selection on your plate, and your plate is usually too small. 
and uh, you have many selections that you want to make and you have this little plate and so you have to be selective and so you go around the tables there and you select this and select that and by the time you've got seven little articles of whatever it is, your plate is overflowing. You've made your selection. You've identified those things that you like. I hope so anyway. And then when people uh, talk with you at lunch, they observe that uh, you like sausage rolls and you like chocolate cake and you like chocolate pudding and whatever because it's all mixed up together on your one plate. You've made your selection. It's an identifier in that of all the stuff that's on the table there, you've identified the, the stuff that you, the food, I should say, that you like best. Well, <coughs> these men were identified as being called by Jesus for a sacred work. And uh, Jesus did something, though. And I just want to read what Alan White had to say about this from the book Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. <coughs> and uh, it is, uh, I'm sorry, it's in Desire of Ages. Sorry, in Desire of Ages, page 296. She says that uh, he ordained them, selecting them out of all those other disciples. And uh, then he took them aside knelt down with them and prayed with them, seeking God's special blessing upon the work that they were about to do. He placed his hands on their heads and prayed a prayer of dedication, dedicating them to the work that he was going to call them to do. She doesn't say that they were going to suddenly be imbued with some extra special virtue, that they were suddenly going to be holy men. History tells us, of course, that they were no more holy after the dedication than they were before, because some of them wanted to burn down the whole city when they rejected Jesus and the disciples. John, the most humble, perhaps, of all the disciples, still had a bit of a spirit in him, and he said, Lord, let's call down fire and burn this place up. And uh, Peter had his little problems too, and he wasn't made a holy man because Jesus ordained him or set him apart for the calling and the work of apostleship because Peter had his problems too, even to the point where at almost the end of his working with Jesus, three and a half years or so, or at least three years, worked with Jesus, he actually denied his Lord. And so the ordination, even the prayer of Jesus, didn't make these men extra holy. It set them apart under the leadership of God, under the direction and recognition of God. It set them apart for a work that is to be done for the people that they would have influence over. Let's have a look in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 6. Acts, chapter 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts, chapter 6. And uh, we read there in those first seven verses there that uh, the church was in need of some special people. Special people to help distribute the common food, the common things that people had brought for the new Christians. Because to become a Christian in those days, as is true in many parts of the world today, it would mean maybe losing your livelihood. And there was a need for <coughs> the, uh, the work of what we would today call welfare work. This was too much for the disciples to do alone, and so uh, they prayed about it, and the Holy Spirit gave them the wisdom to do what others had been advised to do before, bring in people who can do some of this work. And so they chose the seven. In verse 6, we read, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. That's these seven deacons. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So here are these new seven people that were brought in as well as the disciples. Seven new people are brought in 
and uh, these seven men were <coughs> used in the face-to-face -face work of individuals who had specific need. And uh, they were ordained. They were identified. They were set aside for the special work. And they had their hands laid on them. And we'll find out in a minute just what that all signified. These were the new deacons. Deacons. Some of these men became great preachers and teachers and they graduated beyond ordinary deaconship as we would say because Philip became a great evangelist and uh, so did Stephen and Stephen became a martyr of course. Some people say it's a different Stephen. I don't believe that it was. And uh, some of these deacons became great preachers and teachers as uh, they went about their work. And uh, it seems as though that these preachers and teachers who were authorised by the church, <clears throat> were recognised by the leaders of the church as being people who would be suitable to deal with people person to person. You will find in every instance where ordination or the laying of, of, on of hands or identification by the leaders of the church of certain people to do certain work that these people's work was in person-to-person -person work. It wasn't cooking in the kitchen, and it wasn't working in the sanitarium health food factory. It was for person-to-person -person work. So that might give you a bit of a clue as to who should be ordained. It seems to me that if we follow the biblical pattern, everyone being ordained who has to deal person-to-person and deal with the more intimate side of people's lives is the kind of person who would be ordained and the kind of office where ordination would be recommended. Acts chapter 13 and verses 1 to 3. Acts 13 verses 1 to 3. And we read there, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius and so of Cyrene and <coughs> Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Holy Spirit spoke to them, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work whereof I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Saul and Barnabas had already been preaching for some year and a half or more. And uh, yet the church recognised that there was a special work that they needed to do for the Gentiles and for uh, others outside of Jerusalem and Damascus. And so they got together. The Holy Spirit advised them through the impression uh, that was given to them. And uh, these leaders of the church whom we always thought may have been Peter and Paul and so on, but were at this, at this stage. Uh, others, such as Barnabas and Simeon and Niger and Lucius, we don't hear much about them, they were the leaders of the church. And they laid their hands on Barnabas and Saul and sent them off to work for people where they would be dealing with people face to face. They didn't send them off to make tents and to build boats. They sent them off in personal, face-to-face -face kind of work. That comes up every time that you see an instance where the laying on of hands and where ordination is implied. Why are they ordained? Well, we virtually dealt with this, I suppose. <coughs> they were ordained because there was a special work to do for the church. They were ordained for the work of the church. They were selected by the church, they were identified by the church, and they were sent to work on behalf of the church. Now you might say, well, what difference does that make? It makes all the difference if one has accepted that they have been identified by the church to do certain work, they are then obligated uh, <coughs> Uh, morally, to abide by the principles of the church who has identified them to work for them. 
The same as in business, if one is identified to be suitable as in management in a business, that person has an obligation to work for that business and not for the opposition. And so they were ordained to work for the church. <clears throat> and uh, the common factor here, as in all instances I've mentioned, where ordination is specific or is implied in Scripture, it's directed to persons who deal directly with other persons and personalities, and uh, they work for the church. So someone who has been ordained and selected and has hands laid upon them as being identified by the church as suitable for certain work must recognise that responsibility that's been placed upon them and they are obligated to abide, if I can use this term, by the rules of the church. They are no longer independent entities. They can no longer go off and say, I will do my own thing because that would be a rejection of the ordination and the confidence that the church has put in them. And I fear for these people who go off and start their own little movements and they have little arguments with the church in some way and they've been given um, responsibility in the church. Maybe they've been pastors or teachers or leaders or something in the church, but they go off and do their own thing. I fear for their eternal well-being because they have rejected the very principle of ordination. They've gone off on their own tack. And I believe the Lord might say, if you want to be on your own and be so independent, you can stay that way. And you will be independent even when I return again. And if you want to be independent of the main body of the church, you will still be independent when I return and you can stay behind. It's as blunt as that. We need to be careful when we accept ordination because... We have accepted the confidence of the people of the church. These people are set apart to deal intimately with others. We've mentioned that. They don't deal with things, they deal with people. To work for the, <coughs> they are identified to work for the upbuilding and the nurture of God's church on behalf of the church. And because the church wishes to show them their blessing, they lay hands upon them as a sign of the corporate body of the church. It's not sensible or practical for all the church members to come and lay hands on it. So the leaders of the church do that. So who <coughs> ordains them? Who is officiating? In every case you will see that is mentioned or implied in scripture that the highest authority in the church, whatever that may, be consist, uh, may consist of at the time, is used, employed by God as God's representative to lay hands on those individuals. It was in old time a prophet uh, or it was Moses himself who was a prophet or it was, uh, it was uh, a king or a ruler and, uh, or a priest or a high priest or in the New Testament it was the leadership in the church, those who had leadership role in the church. They represented and stood for the whole church body. And so today, when someone is ordained to deaconship, or ordained to be a pastor or a minister, or ordained to be what we call a deaconess, which in the Bible is simply a deacon, but it happens to be a female instead of a male, um, that person is ordained by the leadership of the church, representing that the whole church... And in the Adventist church, that represents the church across the world, stands behind you as one who's been selected to do that work, if you are the one to be ordained. Moses was an ordainer. David was an ordainer. Jesus, of course, was the ordainer par excellence. The Holy Spirit ordained Jesus. Did you realise that? The Holy Spirit ordained Jesus because there was no human being adequate to represent all that Jesus would do. And so the Holy Spirit ordained Jesus at his baptism. Apostles ordained preachers and teachers ordained, as you will see, recommended in the book of Titus. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that someone has been recognised by the church as being enabled by God to do a certain work for the furtherance of the gospel. 
and that church shows their support by asking a special blessing upon the one appointed. It's worth noting <coughs> this little comment, and I'm reading Acts of the Apostles, page 161, and uh, <coughs> it reads here. Alan White wrote this, a commentary on this. On this text about the ordination of Barnabas and Saul. Being be, be, before being sent forth as a missionary to the heathen world, these apostles were solemnly dedicated to God by fasting and prayer and the laying on of hands. Thus they were authorised by the church not only to teach the truth, but to perform the rite of baptism and to organise the churches being invested with full ecclesiastical authority. Now, some people have taken this word ecclesiastical authority, like a friend of mine uh, did, and uh, he, uh, he sort of laughed at this term, ecclesiastical authority. It simply means authority that the church vests in them. That's simply what it means. He thought it meant that they could go and do everything that God could do, but uh, he had quite the wrong idea. Full ecclesiastical authority means that the church, the ecclesia, the church, gives them authority to do things in their name. Therefore, they have a responsibility and obligation to be faithful to the church and its teachings. <clears throat> and uh, she goes on, he instructed the church, Jesus instructed the church by revelation to set them apart publicly to the work of the ministry. Their ordination was a public recognition of their divine appointment to bear to the Gentiles the glad tidings of the gospel. And uh, just over the page, I'd like you to note what she says here. And then I'll give you a little bit of history. At a later date, that's getting into the Christian era, the right of ordination by the laying on of hands was greatly abused. Unwarranted importance was attached to the act as if a power came upon them at once those who received such ordination, which immediately qualified them for any and all ministerial work. And that's what happened. And that's why sometimes we have the wrong understanding of what ordination is all about. You see, the church was pure for a time. The understanding of ordination was simply that one received the recognition of the church, received the authority of the Holy Spirit to work through them on behalf of the church, and that they received the blessing of the church and that the church invoked a blessing upon them, that God would bless their work. And that's what it was all about. It did not give them any sudden big burst of religious or spiritual worth or some huge input of knowledge and wisdom in spiritual things, it was a very simple thing altogether. Just like in old Jewish times, and probably still today, Jewish people will ask a blessing upon their family, and the father will put his hand upon the head of his sons, or his daughters for that matter, and will ask a blessing for them. I think it's a very good idea, and uh, I think some grandparents even do that today. And uh, they ask a blessing. They don't expect that their kids will suddenly jump up from that little experience and that they will be filled with some great awesome power and be great and full of uh, the Holy Spirit more than anybody else. They just simply want to invoke a blessing on them and let the Lord do what he will with them. As time went on, the Church of Rome became extremely influential and powerful in the things of Christianity. And as they grew in power, and as they established a new system of government in the church, where instead of the church being governed by people with wisdom selected from amongst the people, the church became governed by people selected by the already then church leaders. And soon you had <coughs> bishops, not bishops as servant elders, but bishops who were considered to be more holy 
and superior to the ordinary people. And then, of course, eventually you had popery, but that came later. And so as this church became very powerful, they started to uh, develop some new ideas about how the church should be run. And as they looked into various societies, particularly that of the Egyptians, because they set up a school in Egypt, they started to copy some of the things that the Egyptians did in the worship of their heathen gods and in the establishment of their systems of religion. And so it came about that it was considered that when one was ordained, they were given some special power from God that they would never get unless they were ordained. This was never part of the Christian teaching, but it developed. And so only selected people could be ordained, and when those people were ordained, they became authority. Instead of the body of the church being authority in spiritual things, they as individuals became authority. And so you develop some of these fellows that were eventually named the church fathers. Some of them, of course, the early ones were quite correct, but later they became uh, independent in their thought and in their, their teachings, and they taught all kinds of things that are not right. And out of that we developed things like infant baptism. And it, be, <coughs> it was concluded that uh, if there was to be a change in the nature of humanity, it needed to take place at infancy. So a child would be baptised as soon as possible in infancy. And so uh, if one was baptised in infancy, then uh, they were safe uh, from the influences of the devil. And the only person that could do that eventually was the priest. And the priest could only do that if he had authority from what became the cardinal, or as they termed, the bishop. And so the authority in the church got to a narrow point where only a few laid down the law for all the rest. And the idea of ordination became a status symbol on the one hand and a power symbol on the other, and I guess those two both go together. Ellen White says, the right of ordination and the laying on of hands at later times was greatly abused. And she was right. A simple service with a lot of meaning became something which most people could never enter into. And so if one took on the role of a deacon or an elder or a pastor or minister, they could only do it if someone high up in the church authorised it and uh, proceeded with the ordination. Uh, God never wanted it that way. Someone is going to ask me this very horrible question. And I've got a very short time to deal with it. What about women? I knew someone had that question in their mind. What about women? Were women ordained? The roles that we see for women in the New Testament in particular, though we can pick it up in the Old Testament, the roles we see for women in the New Testament in particular that has to do with the corporate body of the church was one, the role of being a, a prophet or a prophetess, as we would call her today, and remember the account of Philip, who was a deacon, and he had four daughters who preached and were prophets, prophetesses. They were preachers and teachers. Now, remember that there's no distinction in the New Testament between a male and a female deacon. A female could be called a deacon or a servant to the church, and Paul lists a number of them. And one in particular is a lady called Phoebe who he gives more time to than any other because she evidently was a very influential lady and she had access to royalty and access to the Empress Palace. And uh, she was a very significant person in the early Christian church, no doubt. And because he names her so emphatically as a servant and one who worked tirelessly for him and for the church, um, it would stand to reason that uh, she was ordained or that she was 
sought out by the church and given the blessing of the church to work in the name of the church. That stands to reason. Paul didn't call people servants unless they were significant in their role in the church. He didn't call the people who helped him sew up tents and so on. He didn't call them servants, not servants of the church. They were just ordinary uh, working people. Uh, spiritual, perhaps, yes. No question about that sort of thing. But a servant was someone in Paul's mind who had been identified as one who worked for the church. And so uh, women, by implication, who worked for the church and took the, t the title of deacon, and we use the term deaconess sometimes because that's the way we like to uh, uh, identify it, um, would have, in all probability, 99.9%, uh, you can be sure that they would have been ordained. Well, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of history about women in the New Testament, not a whole lot, because women mostly were tied to their home and their family. But we need to look outside of the Bible historically to see what the church actually did. <clears throat> sometimes we learn from direct records, which give us instruction, and sometimes by deduction and by implication, which is valid if we can have a good background for it and sometimes by historical accounts and actions and activities. And so we can see that both men and women in New Testament times were baptised. That's an equality, isn't it? Equal before God. We see that both men and women received the Holy Spirit. We can identify that right. We can see that women were preachers and teachers in the New Testament. That's clear. Many women were real, well respected by the apostles for the work or the service or the servanthood that they gave to the church. So that would tell us something too. Women deacons or servants or workers mentioned by Paul in particular uh, were identified specifically because they did such great work. And uh, they, there is no distinction between the work that they did and the work that some of the men that he mentions did. He uses the same language to describe both, as if they were all equal. And so what does history tell us about all this? I had a, found a very interesting article written by uh, Dr. Vimista, who is a lady uh, uh, teacher at Andrews University. I think she's just retired. A very, very uh, clever lady and a very good uh, uh, theologian. And she did some work in this, and she looked up some of the historical accounts of the early church to see how the early church did things. And so I just want to uh, uh, bring a few of these things to you. <clears throat> um, the existence of a deaconess somewhere between 111 and 113 AD is recorded by a fellow called Pliny the Younger, who was the governor of Bithynia. And uh, he had uh, a problem in that he was wondering what to call these uh, people. And so he used the Latin term diakonos. Diakonos is, of course, the same as the Greek term for a deacon. Not a deaconess, but for a deacon. So they saw them just like that. Of the ministry of women, Clement of Alexandria wrote, but the apostles in conformity with their ministry concentrated on undistracted preaching and took their wives around as Christian sisters rather than spouses to be their fellow ministers or fellow deacons, as they have there, as he says here. And... Uh, <coughs> They worked in relation to housewives through whom the Lord's teaching penetrated into the women's quarters where there would be no scandal. So their history tells us that many of the women went with the apostles and the teachers and they were able to work in the households because it would allay any scandal. It wouldn't be too good if the men turned up into the ladies' uh, household, the ladies' quarters while the husbands were away working all the time. It wouldn't look good. So the women who were called diaconi or uh, deacons 
uh, they went with their husbands and did this. It is assumed logically that they were set aside by the church to help to do this work. <clears throat> Another little thought. Tomb inscriptions also provide some evidence that female deacons uh, served in the church and that they were ordained for that purpose, and, and we could list some. <clears throat> What about the ordination of a deaconess and how did they do it? You'll be interested in a prayer that was used by uh, many of the leaders of the church in the ordination of a deaconess, we will call her. And here is one of these prayers that's been recorded. It's there in history. O eternal God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of man and woman, who did replenish with the Spirit Miriam and Deborah and Anna and Hulda, who did not disdain that thy only begotten Son should be born of a woman, who also in the tabernacle of the testimony in the temple did appoint women to be keepers of thy holy gates. Now <clears throat> look upon this thy servant, who is to be ordained to the office of a deacon, and grant her thy Holy Spirit, and cleanse her from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, that she may worthily discharge the work committed to her, to thy glory and the praise of Jesus Christ. That's a good prayer of dedication, isn't it? That's a good prayer of ordination. And uh, so it is clear that women were ordained if they took the role and accepted the role of a deacon. Another wrote that a woman shall not receive the laying on of hands as a deaconess unless she's 40 years of age and then only after careful examination. So there we have it. A woman was considered to be mature, I suppose, at 40 years of age. Perhaps she'd had her family. Perhaps she had the time and the freedom to do these things. But if she qualified, laying on of hands an ordination was to be done. And so what did these women do? Well, history tells us they taught in the homes. History tells us that they baptised the ladies. One of the accounts tells us in later years, when it became so important that only men do these things, that uh, the men pushed the ladies out because they thought it was improper even for a deacon, lady deacon, to be in the baptismal font with a male. And this is some of the stuff that came out of the um, degrading of the Christian church over a period of several hundreds of years. Eventually, of course, the men took it all on and women were relegated right to the background. And for hundreds of years, women were put away in the background when it came to the spiritual work of the church. The devil had his hand over that, I am sure. And so many women missed out on the ministry that could have come to them because the church, gone wrong, prevented it. So <clears throat> the next question is, ordination vitally important? Is it vitally important? My answer might seem strange to you, but my answer is no. Ordination is not vitally important for someone to work for the Lord. Ordination <coughs> does not have to occur for one to use their gifts and their talents and for whatever the Holy Spirit has filled them to do. There would be many thousands and thousands of men and women who have done a great work for the Lord who have never had hands laid on them and have never been ordained and never gone out with the authority of the church upon them, but did go out with the authority of God upon them. And so I say that ordination is not vitally important, but I do say that it is valuable and it is a protection for the church that we identify people, the church identifies people whom they would like to work for them and that those people recognise the obligation and responsibility that they have towards the church as they accept the, <coughs> the trust placed upon them. And so I say, don't cease doing good because you are not ordained. 
Don't cease doing what needs to be done because the church hasn't recognised you yet. But I would suggest that when there is something special to be done in the church, that the church should recognise the blessing that comes from ordaining those people. It does seem to me as I study this and, and read about it and the more I learn about it, the more I come to the conclusion that when one has been ordained by the church and is faithful, that ordination is for life. And that ordination has set that person to work for the church forever. I don't want to sound as though I am downgrading anybody just now when I say this, but I'll say it for you to think about. Why do we ordain deacons to take up the offering in the church? when the kids could do that. Why do we ordain the deacons to take up the offering in the church and the deaconesses now take up the offering in the church and we don't ordain them? Why don't we ordain, ordain deacons, male or female, because we see that they're great to work face to face with other people? They are the right people to meet the visitors at the door of the church. They're the right people to go and visit in the hospital. They're the right people to go and, uh, and give some studies and Bible readings to someone who needs it. They are the kind of people who can get on with people. That's what biblical ordination is all about. And I fear that as a church, we have been influenced by the Dark Ages theology where ordination has lost its real significance and has perhaps been given too much significance in other areas. I believe that if we ask someone to work for the church, we should be prepared to lay our hands on them and ask a special prayer of blessing upon them. And as long as they're faithful, that lasts for the rest of their life and they give their talents and their, their, their gifts uh, to, the, to the Lord's church uh, thereafter as long as as it is possible and expedient to do so. That's my thoughts on the matter. If you've never been ordained by man, however, remember, you can certainly be ordained by Jesus Christ. And if you desire to be baptised and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you have received the highest ordination that can ever be received, and that is the affirmation that God is pleased with you. And so I suggest in closing that if you desire to do something for the Lord, the first step and the first ordination is to be baptised, identify with this church. And if ordination of any other kind comes after that, that's secondary. If you never receive that one, don't worry, do it for the Lord anyway. Let's close with uh, a hymn. We have... Uh, a hymn to sing. We'll ask you to stand as we sing The Church Has One Foundation. Um, could we have just the first and the last verse of this hymn? Is that all right? Thank you. First and the last verse. It's 438 in the hymn book if you're using the hymn book.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have <coughs> been prepared to ordain each one of us with an indwelling of your Holy Spirit. If we'll commit ourselves to you, and if we'll commit ourselves to the service of the church, <coughs> then we know that you will bless us in the greatest way possible. But help us to run our church in such a way that your name can be honoured and glorified and that we have systems in place that are orderly and respectful. Dismiss us today with your blessing, we pray, of the assurance that we find our salvation in Jesus Christ. We ask, please, in his name. Amen. <clears throat>